Welcome to Joint Effort with Des Moines Orthopedic Surgeons. This podcast covers the pain and injuries that are associated with muscles, ligaments, and joints. Welcome to another episode of Joint Effort. I'm Jason Sullivan. I'm here with my partner, Jeff Davick, who's a sports fellowship trained uh, surgeon at DMOS. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks. I think this is the first time in my life I've called you Jeff, by the way. Uh, just barely <laughs> comfortable long, to do that. It's been a long time. <laughs> uh, well, welcome aboard. We're, we're really excited to have you. Um, you are a DM, DMOS fixture, and I'm worried that we're going to run out of, uh, we're going to have, you know, too little time to talk. But our task today is to discuss rotator cuff tears. Okay. We will get there eventually. <laughs> okay. But I just want to hear from you uh, and for our audience, give us a little bit of background. How did you get to where you are? Um, where'd you go to undergrad first off? Uh, University of Iowa. Okay. And then medical school? University of Iowa. We have a lot of that around here, I feel like. Yeah, we do. It's just such a good undergrad experience in medical school that it just seems to be everyone does it. Solid. Um, yeah. So did you know orthopedics right away? I did. I mean, growing up, that was the only type of doctor I ever saw. So okay. um, kind of, I like the anatomy, like the variety of young and old people you to didn't, work with. You yeah. didn't tell your med school interviewee, though, that you want to do ortho, though, correct? Uh, That's we different. didn't have interviews, actually. Oh, didn't. Yeah, we, I didn't. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have gotten in. So Just straight scores? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's easier that way. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, okay, so at Iowa, you knew kind of ortho, so you had to work pretty hard, get a good board score, or whatever it took to get there, right? Right. And then where did you do your residency? Uh, University of Nebraska. Nebraska? Yep. Okay. In Lincoln? Uh, Omaha. Oh, it's in so, Omaha. Yeah, but we rotated in Lincoln and did some sports medicine at uh, with Dr. Claire at University of Nebraska. Did you become a Huskers fan in any way, shape, or form? I did. Seriously? Bit. Yeah. More Hard than the Hawks? To. Hard not to. I mean, when you run out onto the field, and uh, not that I was running, but uh, walk out onto the field. Yep. Um, it, there was one particular day, uh, Nebraska was playing Oklahoma. It was a 2.30 ABC game, and Dr. Claire was running late, and I was talking with uh, George Sullivan, the trainer at the time, and uh, Dr. Claire came running in, and one of the Zaticas was hurt, so we had to kind of run out and see him, and then we had to go tell Coach Osborne uh, what we thought. <laughs> and so. Uh, Coach Osborne would stand on the 50 with his arms crossed and just watch a team warm up. And um, Lynn Swan was on the sidelines. It was an ABC game, and Oklahoma was on the other side, and the place was packed. So uh, Dr. Claire and I walked out to talk to Coach Osborne. So I'm standing at the 50-yard line yeah. with, I mean, just All the game of, of the day. Exposure. And I'm looking around thinking, I, I hope someone who knows me is looking down here right now because yeah. this is pretty cool. That so is cool. It was hard not to become a Nebraska fan situations like that. And you so were wearing fun. a red and white polo. I'm oh, guessing. yeah. Yeah, with the big N on it. Or K, no, N. Yeah. <laughs> so. We're not going to go with any <laughs> Nebraska jokes here, right. but, but I know the joke you're referring to. Uh, so from Nebraska then, <clears throat> you thought, and your personality is perfect for the kind of sports niche and you knew you want to do a sports fellowship right which for our audience is kind of focusing on um, injuries to the knee shoulder um, in uh, as le least of an invasive way you can and getting people back to function when they tear a tendon or a ligament or whatever maybe. right right um, and I've you've told me many stories about your Wisconsin experience um, it seems like that was a, a great time for you as well yeah and yeah. more good college football yeah, great football. Uh, I don't think they had been to a bowl game in, you know, X number of years, 20-some years. And so the year I did my fellowship, they went to the Rose Bowl. Uh, and it was, yeah, it was a fun year, great year. So basically everywhere you've gone, success has followed that football team? Is that what I said? Because you come to town and then you take care of Valley High School for how many years? Uh, well, between Steve Taylor and myself, we did 31 years. Yeah. And they and they won a lot of state titles. A lot, a lot of trips to the dome. And then the interesting right. thing is, uh, you're now at Southeast Polk sidelines, right? And they're one of the best teams in the state again this year. They have, so, yeah, number two right now, and some very right. good players. And I know they have a, a really good chance to to go to the dome and make something happen. Yeah, you just hope the season keeps going. You know, week by week, <laughs> <laughs> you're just waiting for it to implode. 
but uh, uh, with the corona. So. The high school I covered, they did senior night the first night of the yeah. Did they do that Southeast Pub no. too? No. I mean, I was like, what's going on here? And, yeah. and it's actually a brilliant idea because we don't know if we're going to get that next week. Right. Uh, right. We've talked a little bit on this <clears throat> podcast about coronavirus and its impact on surgery. And so we'll try to keep this as light as possible and avoid that topic, although it is kind of pervasive to everyone's mood and existence right now. Right. Um, it kind of permeates everything. But um, in regards to rotator cuff tears, we, we want to talk about your experience and how long have you been in practice now? Uh, 26 years here. So 26 years. Uh, so you've seen a lot of things come and go, a lot of things change, and a lot of things stay the same and be tried and true. Um, and so when we talk about the rotator cuff, explain to people and you know how do you talk to someone about what the rot- rotator cuff does, what it's made up of, you know, in a couple minutes. How do you describe that? Yeah. Well, usually uh, when I'm talking to patients, educating them about the rotator cuff, I tell them it's a series of four muscles that surround the ball and socket part of the shoulder. Um, you have two in back, one on top, and one in front, and, and they kind of work to lift, elevate, and rotate the humeral head. Uh, I tell them that uh, one of the big functions of the shoulder is to position the arm in space so you can do the things you want to do. Um, so we go over that anatomy ab- about the rotator cuff uh, and then talk about the different types of motion, different types of uh, um, weakness that can indicate rotator cuff disease of some sort. Okay. And so when someone comes to you, um, it, the point of, uh, well, it's kind of humorous, but the rotator cuff is like not a word that just rolls off your tongue. So I've heard it called the tater cup, the rotary cup, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it's, it, you, you always know what someone's trying to refer to, but right. it's just, right. um, it's, it's actually easier to say that than the supraspinatus or those, uh, the tendons that we're discussing. Correct. But the supraspinatus happens to be uh, the tendon that's most commonly torn. By far. And yeah. that's the one you're most commonly fixing as well. Absolutely. And, uh, so tell us, you know, when someone loses that function, how, how do, they, why do they come to you? How do you know when they have a rotator cuff tear based on what they're telling you? Uh, well, a lot of times they'll, uh, they'll complain of both pain and weakness. And I think pain at night's a big thing too. And they start saying, you know, I, I can't sleep at night. It just hurts all the time as opposed to just purely an overuse injury or tendonitis that kind of resolves with rest. Knowing how important sleep is, you know, to overall health, do you think, um, uh, a little, uh, harder about fixing a rotator cuff tear that's interrupting their sleep patterns? Is that something what, that's an indication for you? Sure. Sure, and I always talk to people about, you know, if this is interfering your life in that you're not able to do the things you want to do and they're important to you and you're not able to sleep at night, just it's affecting your function during the day, then you should consider having something done. And in your practice and experience, who's the youngest person who's ever had a a full thickness rotator cuff tear that you fixed? Oh, boy. Um, you know, I think back to early in my practice, I always told people, you know, people were worried about having a rotator cuff, and I'd say, well, people our age don't tear their rotator cuff. <laughs> yeah, you, I can't, you, I can't say 30s, that anymore. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> now you go to say it, and you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, you know, I volunteered at Simpson College for the last 25 years or so. Um, we actually had a catcher at Simpson who tore had a no small kidding. tear in a rotator cuff yeah okay yeah by and large most rotator cuff tears though are in your 50s 60s i would think so would you yeah say? yeah um and so it seems like there's kind of two different kinds of general categories there's the the chronic one that kind of develops from some factors in the shoulder we could talk about and then there's the acute one where someone falls slips whatever it may right. be right right um how do you kind of figure out the difference between those two, and do you treat them differently at all? Well, um, no, I treat them more on how they affect the patient. Okay. Um, but I, I do get that question sometimes from patients. They'll say, I, I didn't do anything. How could I have torn my rotator cuff? And, you know, I'm full of analogies. I always tell people it's, it's like getting a hole in your pants. I mean, sometimes you hear the rip, and you look down, and there it is. And other times after 52 years, there's a hole, yeah. and you don't know how it got there. So. Uh, but regardless, if, if they're sore enough to make an appointment, come in, see me, and then I, you know, together we determine it's affecting their lifestyle um, and limiting them from doing the things they want to do, then we start talking about fixing it. Okay. If someone comes to you initially and they have some pain in the shoulder for three months, they're not weak, they're not losing sleep at night, 
are you considering, you know, maybe this is like seemingly the precursor to a chronic rotator cuff tear is maybe some impingement or bursitis or whatever it is. Right. So you're treating that with conservative stuff, PT and physical therapy and stuff. Yep. Maybe a cortisone shot. Okay. And when do you consider then, okay, we need to get an MRI to look further into kind of what's going on? Yeah. I think if they develop weakness, uh, I think, you know, it's, it's a little age dependent, um, a little dependent on their occupation as well. Um, but, um, you know, for a healthy, active person, I think after a couple cortisone injections, if it's coming back fairly quickly within four to six weeks, I think it's time to work it up. Okay. And you get that MRI, and then um, the difference between a really bad tear and a really easy tear can be fairly drastic, right? Right, right. Um, you know, everyone's seen those tears, one centimeter tear, it's barely retracted, patient has pain, you know they're going to do really well. Right. What do you tell someone who has a, a two tendon tear that's retracted, um, you know, four centimeters, um, and they think that they had a fall, you know, a month ago, and, and it caused all this? Are you, how, how do you caution them going into surgery, and what are things you're talking about with them? Yeah, well, I tell them, um, it, and for other things too, not just rotator cuff tears, but I'll talk to them about their injury. And if they say, well, you know, this all started when I fell off the ladder in May and they're 77 years old, I'll tell them if everything that happened in May, I think there's still time to fix and we can fix that. So we're going to make you feel like you did in April, mm -hmm. not we're not going to make you feel 18 again, but I think we yeah. can make you feel like you did in April. And most people say, oh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. No, that's a good way of looking at it. I, I never thought of it like that, but that's a, so sometimes when you go in there, is there a situation where you can repair part of the rotator cuff and some of it is so retracted you can't get it? Or are you pretty, is in most cases, are you able to mobilize the thing and bring it back down? Yeah, I think most uh, tears that occur from an injury, if you're, getting to those within a few months uh, they'll pull back together and again I'll, I'll talk to patients I'll tell them I, I'd rather fix a four centimeter tear that's acute than a two centimeter tear that you've had for 10 years because yeah. the tissue loses its elasticity it's just harder to mobilize and and harder to get from point a to point b if if I were to fall off a ladder today and I have a rotator cuff tear and I say hey I can't you know I have things going on in my life. I can't do this for six months. Are you telling me, hey, you know, are you pretty, with acute tears, are you telling them I li I'd like to get to this sooner rather than later? And what do you think the benefits of, if you believe that, are there benefits to doing that? Or Yeah, I think it, you know, that, then it for sure depends on the size of the tear. And and probably the biggest example I have, are, or the best example are the farmers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they... Tear their around run. harvest. Oh, absolutely. Season. Yeah, they tear For it sure. in August and say, "Hey, can I wait?" And, and you already know what the question is: Can I wait until November? And some uh, of the toughest people on the planet. Yeah. Yeah. By the way. Right. And <clears throat> so there, there are two sides to that. If if you do fix it and they do super well, they're going to go back way too early because they have to, or their neighbor gets tired of helping them out. Um, but a lot of them can wait but if if i have a real large tear i'll tell them it's going to be a lot harder to fix in november but for the most part i, I think you have a few months uh, okay. to wait and even a big tear can still mobilize pretty well why is it that some people with a rotator cuff tear can barely move their arm and some people have full motion they just have pain yeah I think it has to do, you know, Doug Harriman talked about the cable system of the rotator cuff. You know, it's it's actually a sheet of tissue. So um, I don't know. I'm sure you have patients afterwards. I, did I have two tears or one tear? Because somebody said it's my infraspinatus and supraspinatus. So did you find two or one? I have to explain. You know, everything coalesces into one sheet. But I think within that sheet of tissue that attaches to the humeral head, there are certain bands, certain thicknesses similar to the ligaments in the capsule of the shoulder that are more important. So if you have a longitudinal tear in between, you know, in the anterior or posterior rotator cuff interval, it can be a full tear and people can function very well. Mm -hmm. But if you lift off most of the footprint of the supraspinatus, you're going to be pretty miserable. Yeah. And, uh, and that's when they get into not being able to lift their arm. Right. 
loss of strength and everything like that. Yep. When you when you go to fix them, do you tell them, hey, um, let's say it's a 55 year old who tears a rotator cuff and it was acute. Are you telling them re it's reasonable to expect near full recovery? They do. Okay. Yeah. And if they play golf or if they want to throw a ball with their kids or whatever it may be, when do you, when do you let those things come in after a repair? Um, for uh, for golf, usually around three to four months, I'll let them putt and chip. I'm admittedly pretty conservative about things, but yeah. a full swing or hitting a wedge, uh, I tell them probably wait the full five six months. Especially if they take divots, yeah, huge yeah. divots, and you're worried you have the grounds <laughs> yeah. hard one day. And, right, right. Um, you probably are more conservative because you've, in your experience, you've seen the people that start doing stuff a little too quick and then maybe have a retear or pain that's hard to figure out. Right, right. Okay. And again, my my approach to that, it, it's easier to tell, kind of like the ACLs we do, it's easier to tell them at three months, you know what, you've invested three months of your life into this, why would you want to mess it up in the next four weeks? Just give it the full healing time. Yep. And and it's, it's much easier when they've invested some time into it to say, you're doing great, everything's perfect, let's not rush it. You're uh, curious to get your experience on rotator cuff repairs uh, with using regional anesthesia versus not. Have you noticed, uh, lately we've gone to regional anesthesia at a surgery center. Seems like it's helped with in terms of getting them home quicker, feeling more comfortable. Right. Uh, but in your experience, have you seen, is there a change? Has it been helpful to have that added modality for patients? I think so. Um, and, you know, I was one of the last ones to kind of, uh, go to regional anesthetic along with the general. Um, I always, we did a general anesthesia and I would do a suprascapular nerve block at the end of the case. And you do it yourself. Yeah. I thought the patients did well. And, and, uh, so you were already essentially treating <clears throat> there to some degree you were doing the regional anesthesia for them. Yeah. But it, you know, it's kind of a guess. Yeah. I mean, you, you go down to the spine of the scapula and you, it's the way that, uh, Dr. Bergman told me they did it at Mayo Clinic, so yeah. that's what I did. Yeah. And it seemed to work well. Patients were doing well. But as uh, one of the anesthesiologists told me, just because your patients are doing well doesn't mean they can't do better. So we tried a couple, and they did great. So we've had a you know a handful of patients that will take a couple pain pills. And I just think as that block wears off, they're at home, they're situated, they're a little more kind of prepared. They take the pain medicine blocks wearing off and they, they just don't get that huge spike where they wake up in the recovery room and say, well, this really hurts. Right. And you're playing catch up for 48 hours. Yeah. That's probably the biggest difference. I think you're right. Yeah. Uh, Less nausea too. I mean, they really don't require a lot of general anesthetic. True, I guess. So, yep. Uh, Keeping them under. They wake up and they understand the instructions when they're leaving. They're not all doped up and thrown right. up. Sometimes things we don't even think about around the, the, the case, but right. those are really important. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so, are you a guy who, there's two different camps. There's the, and I think I know which camp you're in, but there's the camp that right away physical therapy, get moving as soon as you can to avoid stiffness, and that's a dreaded you know, complication of a rotator cuff repair, or don't move too fast, we're worried you might tear it, re-tear it before it heals, let's mobilize for a little bit and bring therapy in later. Or are you in a, in a hybrid situation? Where do you exist in, in that ar arena? Yeah, I keep them. I'm pretty conservative. Keep them pretty still for the first two weeks. I just let them do elbow and wrist range of motion, keep the shoulder real still. I think it's easier to work with some stiffness. Um, I think that, uh, uh, yeah, I just don't feel like pushing things. Yeah. yeah. It, it just eliminates some variables. Yeah. And, you know, most things that we do now, I think if if we allow people to rehab the way they want to, they're going to go a lot quicker than biology anyway. So I think the bi biology of getting a tendon to heal down to the bone it takes much longer than two to three months. And if we let them go real fast, everyone would want to, you know, go full speed at three months. And yep. I think that's too quick. So I don't mind slowing them down some. Everyone's had that, you know, my friend did this and, right. you know, you fix a, a pec tendon these days and everyone heard J.J. Watt was playing football within what? You know, four weeks. And right, right. They think that, oh, this is the new way to do it. And, yeah. Um, it's difficult kind of telling people that the worst thing that can happen is what we did, you know, is just undone by moving too quickly or, you know, and sometimes it's just handcuffing your patient a little bit more than they normally would so they so they don't push the 
you know, boundaries a little bit because we all do to some extent. Right, right. And some of my patients that do the best come up, come at post-op day or the second visit, they haven't used their sling at all and they're doing fine and they get away with it. But right, right. the heartbreak of saying we need to get a new MRI, see what's going on here, yep, yep. Uh, just probably isn't worth it, right? It, I don't think so. And again, another analogy, I tell them it's like driving your car 120 miles per hour probably going to be okay but two things can happen and they're yeah. both bad so don't do it so. <laughs> another question i have for you um i feel like i'm just picking your brain right now um just so you're i get these answers you're myself. almost done <laughs> I, just, I just want these answers myself why do some patients have a week or two worth of fairly decent amount of pain and then <clears> some <throat> people say i had the block i took a pain pill or two and i've been good the whole time what, what's the difference there? Is it luck? Is it biology? Is it personality? Is it the way you repaired it? Yeah. Um, Have you seen that in your practice? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, for younger people, I think it, the size of, of the tear matters a lot. And so if, if somebody has a really large tear, especially a younger person, uh, I'll put them on a muscle relaxer. I think that's almost as helpful as a pain pill because they get the spasm in the muscle just because you're pulling on that rope so hard to get it reattached um i had a recent patient that you know for whatever reason we did he had bilateral rotator cuff tears and we did them pretty close together and the first one he just sailed through and the second one he kind of knew at the end of the case there's a little more bleeding than normal and he really struggled with that so um you know even though you try to cauterize every everything kind of nice and neat and tidy and dry at the end. If there's a little bleeding there, they're going to, I think, have a little more pain. Okay. So they just have to work through it a little bit more therapy and things like that? Yeah. I think at six weeks, they're kind of all in the same boat. The worst that can happen is you fix someone's shoulder and they do phenomenal. Right. And then they have the same injury on the other shoulder. You can only do as good, if not fail, comparatively, right? Exactly. I tell um, them it's either going to be worse or better. <laughs> but there's no way you're going to do better than that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I, so I, then they I agree. Prepare. You yeah. fail by your own comparison. Right, um, right. So it sounds like you can get almost ro any rotator cuff tear reapproximated or fixed. Are there some that you look at an MRI where you decide not even to try? Or will you give everyone a, the good college effort and then if you can't get it, say we couldn't get it back? Or even use a – tell us about the – you do use a patch every once in a while. I do. Yeah, if there's enough to connect into, I think uh, using that patch is helpful. And I tell people it's, you know, it's like the mesh they use in a hernia. Um, if and we get it sewn into patch, the tendon. You're trying to sewing the patch into the tendon and then the other end of the patch into the bone. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And what do you use, just high tensile sutures to do that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What is the patch made of? Is it a mesh of some variety or? Yeah, it's uh, pig mucosa. Okay. Isn't it weird telling patients that, hey, we're going to use an animal's collagen <laughs> right. to help, you know? Yeah. I hope you blurt that out on the podcast so people don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, they're, they're consented for it, and if right. they ask, you tell, you know, but right. it's a widely accepted thing. Yeah. Xenografts are used all the time right? Uh, in orthopedics, especially if you're trying to re-engineer tissue and get tension. You know, some tendons are so thin, now it seems a lot of focus is on, can you fix it and then maybe augment it with something on top sure. of it? We don't know where to go with that just yet. Yeah, yeah. But well, a lot of what we do is just collagen scaffolding of some type. Get the new cells, uh, reparative collagen cells, to heal across that bridge. It always sounds terrible when you tell people we just want it to scar down. <laughs> right. Right. But right. I mean, that's essentially it's not healing like it used to. It's essentially forming a high tensile scar. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Another question for you. Normally the tendon tears off the bone, so you have some tendon to work with. What do you do with the rotator cuff where the tendon is still on the bone and you see just a tiny sliver of tendon and mostly muscle? How do you manage that problem? Uh, those are tough. Uh, number one, they're hard to reach. Number two, it's hard to get the suture to grasp into the muscle. Uh, a lot of times with those, I'll go a little more side to side. So you kind of cheat a little bit and get more into the tendinous portion as you go laterally on the rotator cuff and then as you bring that together it, it'll close that defect some okay yeah i remember uh i think my first couple of months i scrubbed a few with you and and uh it, it was interesting every tear pattern is different 
Right. And the way you kind of handle things, the way you weave your stitches, it's it's you're trying to replicate what used to be normal anatomy, but it's like you're deconstructing a, a, a bomb that went off in the shoulder sometimes, yeah. and sometimes it's just not there. You know, yeah. you work with what you got. Right. Right. Um, have you found that doing that when you augment with a patch, patients do fairly well? They do. I think they have, uh, and I always tell them afterwards, it's going to be very helpful for pain relief. You might not get as much strength back as, as we would hope. So, Last question, yep. and I promise. Um, it, it, when you talk to a patient and counsel them, um, and they always ask, like, well, how long, how long do I have the wait? Um, will it get worse? How do you... We all know that rotator cuff tears <clears throat> tend to get bigger in size over time. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily know when they progress. Um, but how do you how do you surveil a uh, rotator cuff tear if someone doesn't want to have it fixed? You say, "Come see me in six weeks, months, or a year." Or how do you handle that situation? Well, um, I tell them I'm happy to see them anytime. I tell them what to watch for: mainly uh, increased pain, decreased motion, um, a weaker shoulder. Um, but usually we're going over the MRI scan and I'll say this is how it is now if it gets bigger it's gonna let you know by the things I just talked about if it lets you know you let me know and we'll do it sooner rather than later so yeah. I think it's um, a, most people if they really think about where where they are at that point and they know what's gonna make it worse or what indicates that it's worsening they'll let you know uh, there's not many surgeries that are as gratifying as a really miserable patient who's in so much pain and dysfunction and then having a good result. Right. Would you agree with that in your practice? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's amazing restoring their overhead function. And I would say our techniques and our approach to treating it has gotten so much better that our failure rates, I think, are a lot lower right. than they used to be. Yep. I remember reading these studies in residency, failure rates were 50%. Uh, these historical studies you think man that doesn't even sound like a good operation yeah yeah but and you know when i was a resident you know 100 years ago people were miserable with rotator cuff tears i mean you just you dreaded seeing them in the office afterwards now they're you know some of our happiest patients yep. yeah even at three months sometimes they come in and oh yeah yeah. Do this and you don't need to even see them again if they're doing that well right right you know it's going to be the slow down talk uh more than the trying to pick them up talk well thank you so much for coming on we yeah, very much you're appreciate it everyone's heard it here from the expert in rotator cuff tears Jeff <laughs> i don't David. know about that I so, think so thank you all right thanks for listening to joint effort a podcast from des moines orthopedic surgeons if you have questions about this podcast and wish to schedule an appointment with the surgeon call 515-224-1414 or visit dmos.com